Hello and welcome to Remote, the Connected Faculty Summit. My name is Nisha Shridharan and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, there are a few things to note. On the left side of your screen, you'll see a panel with a few key tabs. Chat allows you to interact with your fellow attendees. Please feel free to use that at any time during the presentation. The questions tab enables you to submit your questions for the speaker to answer at the end of the presentation. You can also click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. Again, please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation. Slides and other related sources can be found in the handouts tab. You can download this by clicking the view button. If needed, resize and rearrange the panels on your screen just like you would on a browser window. Click the icons on the bottom of your screen to open or close additional panels such as speaker bios, abstract, share, and also handouts. Should you have any technical issues, please refresh your browser. If your issue is not resolved, please submit a note to the questions tab for assistance. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available to watch on demand after the event. Now, on to the presentation. Consistency, clarity, and convenience. The three C's to increase the number of a, A's and B's when teaching large lecture sections of general chemistry remotely. Discussing today's topic is Cassie Mies, general chemistry lecture coordinator, assistant teaching professor at Colorado State University. Welcome, Cassie. Now, let's get started. Hi, thank you, Nisha. So thank you all for joining. Um, I see a lot of people from a lot of different places there, and even Waldo Powell, who it's great to see you. I'd love to connect later. Um, as Nisha said, I'm gonna be talking today about um, consistency, clarity, and convenience the three C's to, teach, to increasing the number of A's and B's when teaching large lecture sections of general chemistry remotely. So I'm the general chemistry lecture coordinator at Colorado State University. And so the first thing I wanted to do is just talk to you a little bit about our program and um, just the magnitude of our program and some of the things that influence the decisions that we've made. I should preface my talk by saying that um, in no way do I feel like we completely mastered this going remote thing. I think we're all in a lot of ways um, swimming blindly and trying to figure this out as we go. But there are some things that we did that worked really well and some other things that we did that we are, are definitely revising for our summer classes and then even making further revisions for our fall classes, which in terms of the lecture sections will also be remote. So I wanted to introduce our team. Um, we have a very large, robust program in general chemistry. We have approximately 2,500 students each fall semester going through our Gen Chem program. Um, that includes roughly four classes. These are the typical classes that we run every semester. And then often there's a, a, an additional um, a majors course that goes through or some other courses from semester to semester that vary. But these are the ones that we have consistently. So we have about 50 students in a half semester of problem solving and chemistry course, which is intended to be a prep course to get students ready for general chemistry. Um, it can also be used as a credit recovery course for students halfway through the semester who are struggling with the draw and then they have a place to go to prepare to take general chemistry the next semester. Um, Foundations in chemistry is a one semester course in the specific majors that don't necessarily need the math intensity of the Gen Chem 1 and Gen Chem 2 combo. And then we offer the traditional Gen Chem 1 and Gen Chem 2 combination. Um, these are some of the faculty members that work on our team. Um, we have a team of six of us who are full-time non-tenure track faculty who all teach in the general chemistry program. So Harmony Tucker, Carlos Olivo, Terry Gray, myself, um, that is obviously not a picture of Mallory mentally, but her twin babies are just so cute, I couldn't resist putting them on there. Um, and then Carrie McFarland, um, that is our, our team. So between the six of us, we make decisions as a group um, approaching our general chemistry courses. So within each of these courses in a given semester, we have a shared syllabus and a course outline that is shared for all of our different sections. We merge all of the sections into a single learning man management system for all four sections so that every student receives the same announcements, 
Um, when we post the learning goals and outcomes as a study guide, they all they all know that the exams are going to be written by the group of professors together based on this common set of learning goals and outcomes. We share all of the resources. So if one instructor posts their lecture notes, those lecture notes are also available to the students in the other sections. Um, all students have common homework assignments and deadlines. And we also have common exams so that we have consistency across all of our sections. I should note that while we do have a, a lot that we share in common across the different sections, the individual instructors do have autonomy over their individual lecture, lecture sections. And we do have a wide variety of different teaching approaches. We have some people that in person um, will teach in a completely flipped style um, all the way to some people who teach in a completely lecture mode. So there is autonomy in individual sections. In our courses, and this is basically our course structure before we went remote. And so what I'm going to sort of do is walk through what we did before going remote and what we were able to retain in going remote, and then the aspects of the course that we had to change in going remote. So we have a course structure that's based on the principle of guided growth and learning. So we have three times per week, um, we have these kind of daily lecture activities. So we have a pre-lecture activity starting from the left-hand side that is um, learn smart activities. So these are pre-reading assignments that the students do online through their textbook before they get to lecture. Those are due typically at the start of the first lecture of the day. Then the students attend lecture, and those are worth 4% of their 4% of their overall grade. The students then attend lecture, and 3% of their grade is based on their participation in lecture. I'll talk about this a little bit more in a couple of slides, but each of our instructors handles that a little bit differently as to how they grade the partic participation portion of their particular section. But we do um, value participating in lecture, and so we, we offer some credit for students for um, participating in, in correctly answering questions in lecture or on discussion boards. After each of the three lectures per week, we have an Alex assignment which is a graded homework assignment in an adaptive learning program and it all online, which is based on the information that's covered that day in lecture. So that cycle happens three times per week where they do a pre-reading, they come to lecture, and then they go home and they do an assignment based on that particular lecture. Then once a week, we have a more in-depth homework assignment. The program that we use is called Connect, but it, it's just the end of the chapter problems that are connected with basically any textbook that you would use. Our program happens to be McGraw-Hills Connect. And those are a little bit longer. They're only due once a week. Typically, we have them due on Monday for the previous week's lectures. So they do Monday, Wednesday, Friday lecture. And then on the following Monday, they have a homework assignment that's longer and more in-depth based on the previous week's material. And then they also have a weekly recitation. So the recitation meeting also is based on the previous week's material and allows them to go a little bit more in depth, maybe focus on something that's hard to cover in the homework, a more conceptual understanding of something. Um, but they, they meet in person for one hour, 50 minutes, and um, work in groups on a recitation project, which is also graded and comprises 10% of their overall grade. So they go through this cycle weekly, three times per week of, of pre-reading lecture, post-lecture, mini assignment. And then they have, after that, each of the weeks, they have these weekly connect assignments and then also recitation assignments. And then every third week, that builds up to an exam. Exams in our courses are worth about 65% of their overall grade. Um, and I should say, in each of our different classes, we utilize different aspects of this guided growth and learning. This is our general chemistry one structure. Um, and so there's some variation in Gen Chem 2 and even in our one semester Chem 107 course. So this all builds up to an exam that they have once every third week. And then after each exam, we give them a post-exam self-assessment, which is also an online assignment that really encourages them to reflect on this process to see how well they utilized this guided growth and learning to get to the exam. 
you know, were they just doing the homework for completion and a grade, or were they really thinking about it as preparation for the exam, and then they start the whole cycle over again. So in the middle of last semester, we suddenly went remote, as, as you all did. And so there were certain aspects of this that we had to really rethink and restructure. Our primary goal in restructuring to go remote was to try to be as consistent as possible as to what we had already laid out in the syllabus. And so luckily, a lot of what we did with the activities that are shown in black um, are activities that are online anyway, and so we really didn't have to make any changes to those, those activities. Lecture and participation, recitation, and exams, however, were three areas that had to completely change because they used to be in person. So I'm going to talk about what we did for each of those and what worked and what didn't work. First, we'll start with lecture changes. We service large numbers of students, so our lectures, the maximum capacity is 258. Um, and so we do have some smaller classes that are closer to 50, but most of our lectures are fairly large lectures. And previously, all of these lectures were delivered in a face-to-face -face mode and recorded using Echo 360 as a recording system. We're fortunate to have these systems built into our larger lecture hall. Paul's unfortunate to have such large lectures, but fortunate to have the recording capability. And so they were already being recorded and posted online. When we moved to remote lectures, these remote lectures were posted in the LMS by each individual instructor. So one of the things that we went back and forth about was whether to only post one lecture for the entire course or whether to have each instructor individually post lectures. And in the end, we ended up having each, not mandatory, but we voluntarily, each instructor decided to post their own lectures. Part of that was to keep the continuity with the students. Students really seem to get in a pattern of understanding how their lecture instructor operates. And so they, they tend to like watching a particular instructor. So most of our instructors pre-recorded these lectures and posted them in advance so that students could view them when they wanted. We did have a few instructors who offered live viewings at the same time as their original course was structured to meet. So they would actually go into the empty classroom and do their normal lecture as those students were there, which felt kind of odd to a lot of people, but it, but it, it worked. We did have many students that watched live viewings. And then those recordings were also posted for students who couldn't synchronously watch the lecture recordings. The one thing that I will say is that our student lecture viewing, when we look at the analytics, varied significantly by instructor. So the issue that we saw in going remote is that if we already had student buy-in for that particular instructor, the students were much more likely to continue watching their lectures and um, saw the value in those lectures. But there were some sections where the students really only saw the value in earning the participation points of going to lecture. And so in those other sections, it, the students really trailed off in their viewing as the semester went on. And the other thing that we noticed is that some of the students stop watching the recordings for their particular lecture instructor, which is just fine if they, you know, if they learn better from a different um, type of instruction, and none of us really have a problem with them watching whichever instructor they want if the important thing is for them to learn the material. So some ideas that we have for the fall semester, um, we've really gone back and forth, but some faculty feel that requiring lecture viewing is a graded component of the course is essential to getting them to actually watch the lectures to learn. We do have other faculty that don't want to do that, and they, they want to continue um, using a different mechanism of, of awarding participation points. So that's something that's going to vary instructor to instructor. Some instructors plan to require lecture viewing and to either monitor the analytics using a graduate assistant to get points for that. Um, or to incorporate some kind of participation points into the actual lectures themselves to ensure that the students are actually watching these lectures. 
So that brings us to the participation changes. So previously part of our um, of our participation and lecture viewing um, grade was based on the idea that the students needed to participate in the course in some way. But individual instructors in our program really vary on their participation in face-to-face -face mode. So originally we had some instructors who based their participation on discussion boards that were specific to their lecture sections. So they had the students had to participate and were graded based on their participation in those discussion boards. And in those sections, there was no mandatory attendance policy before we went remote. So in some ways that those lecturers had a little bit easier of a time because they didn't really have to change anything. Many of our lecture instructors use clickers for in-class problem solving. And part of the clicker points were given for the Chemo 101 app is another option. Same idea, um, asking questions during lecture. And some points are given for participation. Some points are given for correctness of their answers. So we have a balance of, hey, you need to show up. It's important. We'll give you a point for that. But also, if you get the correct answer, we'll give you a second point for that. And that was the graded component of the course, the lecture portion of the course. In moving remote, um, we had to change the clicker points and the Chem 101 app points to create clicker quizzes in the LMS or on our online learning platform. And so some instructors took their clicker points, just completely eliminated the clicker aspect of clicker points and created mini quizzes that just fell into that graded category of clicker quizzes. So instead of removing the category altogether, we kept the category but just had weekly quizzes. Um, the folks that were using the Chem 101 app actually continued using the app because they could still post the same questions that they would have asked in class. They just gave more time for students to answer those questions. So we did a variety of things in moving remote to ensure participation in, in um, the course. We have a lot of different ideas for the fall semester, um, but I will say in looking at the summer classes, I think that Creating some form of engagement through participation in the class is a really important aspect to getting buy-in from the students. In our summer courses where some of our instructors have not included a participation course portion of the grade, we've had really low um, buy-in from students, um, low lecture viewings, a lot of resistance to doing the assignments or frustration with a number of assignments where when we can get the buy-in from the students to see that we've set up this program that works for them, they're much more likely to buy into the system and to, to move forward, um, trusting that we've set this up for them to be successful and not just to be awful mean instructors who are giving them too much work, but that the work actually serves a purpose in them learning. So for the fall semester for participation, some of the ideas that various faculty have had are embedding participation questions in the lectures. So posting those lectures, um, but potentially embedding questions in the lectures that you couldn't answer without watching the lecture. Maybe even only stating the question. So question one on today's participation is this. And then when they go to the participation quiz in the LMS or the homework system, the question isn't even listed. They have to watch the video to be able to see what, what question they're answering. So embedding participation questions in the lectures that can be answered in graded quizzes is one idea. Um, we have also had some faculty suggest giving particip participation grades for viewing the lecture. So simply for opening the lecture, one issue with that is that students are savvy and so they learn how to just open the lecture and not really watch it. But to earn the points, they just open the lecture. I'm not sure we can completely get around cheating, but. Um, but it is nice if there's actually something embedded in some way. Um, and a third idea is just giving participation points for posting the discussion board. So maybe creating a discussion board after each lecture to, so that students have an opportunity to present questions um, in those discussion boards and discuss them amongst themselves and with the graduate teaching assistants and faculty members. So the next portion of the class that we had to change was recitation. So recitation, again, is this weekly meeting that the students do in smaller groups. 
Um, the groups are around 40 students, and so going remote, we had to change the way that we did recitation completely. Um, what I'm talking about here is specifically for a general chemistry one course. This is the only course that we have an official recitation in um, that is mandatory. So in some of the other classes, there are non-mandatory recitations where, where other things were done. But in Gen Chem 1, previously, students completed recitation worksheets during these times in groups. Um, they would open up each recitation with a clicker question where um, half of the clicker question was really did you show up on time today? So they would get two points just for answering and then two points for correctly answering whatever the initial opening clicker question was. Then they would work on a worksheet for about 40 minutes in the middle of the recitation and their participation grade was for working on the worksheet in the group. I will say that there's a lot of debate about that participation grade. We have a hard time getting um, the graduate teaching assistants to enforce the participation and to really make sure that the students are getting something out of that. So that's one aspect of recitation that we've talked about changing for the fall semester. And then we end with a closing clicker question, which again, partly the credit is awarded just for answering and partly credit is awarded for answering correctly. So it's kind of like taking attendance at the beginning, taking attendance at the end, but also adding a question in to that, that, that they get some credit for answering correctly or not. Um, as we went remote, worksheets were the same worksheets that they would have done in class were now provided online and we cut out the clicker questions altogether so there was no mandatory attendance. The worksheets were due on Friday of each week and students were allowed to attend any section that met virtually um, that was convenient for them. Their grades were based partially on the completion of the worksheet and a very little portion was based on submitting correct answers. This did not work very well for us. So we are definitely gonna change this moving into the fall semester. Um, students did not attend while we allowed them to attend any section that worked for them, they chose to just do the worksheets on their own and submit them by Friday each week and did not work together on them, did not attend virtually any of these recitation sections. So we had pretty empty recitation sections. The graduate teaching assistants didn't have much to do um, during those times. And so for the fall semester, we are looking to meet virtually or in small groups. We are potentially going to be on campus for some small group work. So we are going to encourage them to either meet virtually or in small groups. Um, the assignments, one, another idea is that our assignments will only be able to complete it during a specific synchronous recitation time to encourage them to actually attend and that they have to be completed with the group. We're not quite sure how to do the grading on that, but we'd like for there to be a group work aspect to the assignments. Um, we also are going to try releasing the assignments at their designated recitation times to encourage them to participate in their own rec their assigned recitation time to keep the groups at consistent numbers. And then we are thinking we'll make those due immediately after recitation to give them only the hour of recitation to work on these extra activities and then hand them in immediately um, for grading rather than giving them an open-ended full week to complete them where a lot of copying is going on and they're not really collaborating on the recitation activities. Previously, so moving on to exams, previously we had in-person proctored exams of 1,250 students gathering in one building, so clearly that is not an option um, as of the middle of last semester for the foreseeable future. Um, all of the exams and all of our courses then had to move to online exams. So we had a variety of different things that we tried in our various classes. Only one course, the Fundamentals of Chemistry course, gave proctored exams. Um, some of the other faculty were worried about proctoring the exams and the added complication. Um, that was an issue in many of our classes. A lot of exam questions showed up in tutoring sessions, on CHEG, in various places because they weren't proctored and there was nothing preventing them from taking screenshots or doing things while they were taking the exam to ask questions. We allowed our students a larger window of time to take the exam, one to two days, to provide some flexibility. I know there were a lot of internet issues throughout the spring semester that still continue for many students. We have some students who are remote in the mountains and have just very poor connections. 
Um, and so we tried to give them a little bit longer of a window to, to take the exam um, to work around their busy schedules. And then our, our exam time limits were all extended, but our time limits varied. So we went from an hour to an hour and a half to somewhere around an hour and a half to three hours to take the exam to allow students more time in case they had internet issues. For our fall semester ideas, we, um, we really feel strongly that some form of online proctoring is necessary to keep the students honest. There is just a lot of cheating that we've seen in many different places, in different, different mechanisms um, over the past several months, more so than what we would see normally in person. So we really feel strongly about proctoring all of the exams and setting those expectations up front at the beginning of the semester. We're also going to limit our exam windows to just one day to limit the amount of communication um, between students about the exam content. And we're going to reduce the time limit to a more reasonable like 90 to 120 minutes. We do see value in giving the students more time to take the exam so they don't feel the stress and anxiety. But at the same time, um, creating a window at the end of the exam allows them less time to be able to look things up, to text their friend and ask questions, um, and just provides an end cap to the, to the exam itself. And then the last thing is because we have this online opportunity and don't have to provide the proctoring ourselves, we're really moving toward more frequent lower stakes exams. We feel that having weekly, bi-weekly, or even every third week exams will really um, limit the stakes on the exams and reduce the incidence of cheating because the stakes aren't quite so heavy in the weight of their grade. So some ideas moving forward, and I'll try to wrap up. I know we only have a few minutes left, but um, creating a routine, routine with consistency has, has been really important for us. So regular and frequent assignment deadlines, do it the same days and times each week, really helped our students to keep a routine. It's been hard for all of us to keep a routine during this remote time, um, and so keeping that consistency for them really helped many of our students. We also think a regular frequent testing schedule, either once a week on the same day, bi-weekly, or every third week on the same day, um, is very helpful to the students in maintaining consistency and keeping up with the coursework. For clarity, we are trying for the fall semester to create weekly modules that have all of our assignments and recommendations in them. We believe in posting announcements, but right now I think students are bombarded with announcements, and so they are having a hard time deciphering what's important and what's not, and a lot of things are just not being read. They're, they're missing announcements. And so regular, but not too frequent announcements and reminders. And then for convenience, organizing the course materials in order through links in, in a single location. So as an example, this is a summer course where week one, the first thing to do is read the course syllabus. If you click on the course syllabus, um, in that module, you can read it. Um, the second thing is printing the course outline. The third thing is printing the exam cover sheet and then moving into the assignments, printing the PowerPoints, watching the lectures, and giving them a clear um, guideline in what to do step by step each week as they're working through the course so it doesn't feel too overwhelming. Okay, it looks like I have run right up to the edge, so I'm going to let it go to questions there. And I thank you all for your time, and I'm open to answering a few questions in the short time that we have left. Thank you for your presentation, Cassie. I know we just have a couple minutes. I'm just going to go with a couple of questions that a lot of people have asked. One of them is, uh, what about chemistry labs? What are the What is the way you're working for that? That is an excellent question. So I'm our general chemistry lecture coordinator. We also have a general chemistry lab coordinator and our lab courses are completely separate from our lecture, lecture courses. Um, so I know that they're working really hard. Um, a lot is up in the air as to whether we're gonna be meeting remotely or in person, but they've talked about a lot of different ideas from splitting the lectures into or the, the labs into smaller groups and meeting every other or every third week in person and then doing virtual remote labs in the off weeks. 
um, to doing everything completely virtually. So I think there's a lot still up in the air, not knowing whether we're going to be actually physically on campus in the fall or not at this point. They're trying to, to leave things open to be able to make those decisions. Uh, and well, this is probably going to be the last question today. Uh, what proctoring methods would you use and how do you perform online proctoring is one of the questions that's repeated a lot. Sure. So ProctorU um, is one company that does online proctoring. Um, Respondus is also another company. So there are companies that offer these services. A lot of them are based on um, the student session being recorded and then within those recordings, specific behaviors are flagged. So in Respondus, for example, it locks down their browser so they can't open up any other browsers. Um, and it locks them into the exam so they can only access the materials that you have available for the exam. They have to scan their area to show that they only have a calculator and whatever materials you've allowed them. Um, and then within the recording that's created, sometimes there's a live proctor and sometimes it's just a recording but they have um, special software that flags behavior that looks like cheating, like if the student is you know, looking off to the side and doing something else that looks suspicious the entire time they're taking the exam, it gets flagged and then you can either re review it yourself or um, the, uh, you can have your graduate teaching assistants or faculty members can review flagged behaviors. Perfect. Unfortunately, we're out of time today. Um, once again, I would like to thank Cassie for joining us today and providing your firsthand experience. Please be sure to explore the event to access more valuable resources from our sponsors and network with peers. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.